Hi, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Inside Talk, our monthly event series designed to educate, inform, and inspire future travel. We tap into our internal uh, product managers and wonderful partners and Talc tour directors from around the world to give you a small glimpse of what to taste on tour uh, with Talc. We hope these events provide you with an hour's worth of hope, possibility, and positivity as we set out to travel the world once again. My name is Dustin Smith. I work here on the marketing team at Talc, and thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. Today, we'll, we will be joined by special guest Klaus Fiersch, product manager for our longtime cruising partner in the Galapagos Metropolitan Touring, as well as our own David Louie, product manager for many land and cruise journeys throughout the world here at Talc, including the Galapagos. Before we get started, just a couple housekeeping items. Everyone is on mute. If you do have questions, please type them into the chat function. I will be looking at that throughout. I will answer what I can and we'll save uh, most of the questions for the end of the presentation with some, for some Q&A. Uh, we'll get to as many of them as possible at the end. It just depends on how many there are. Uh, I know many of you probably have questions about your upcoming cruise or tour with Talc, and thank you for, for booking with us. Uh, we won't be getting into tour specifics today. Um, so if you do have those questions and want to get some answers, please call our reservation sales counselors or visit us at talc.com slash health for all the latest information regarding entry requirements and uh, specifications about your tour. This presentation will last roughly one hour and it is being recorded um, and will be available for viewing uh, later tomorrow afternoon on our blog page at the Talker. We're also streaming this live on Facebook. So if you do have any technical difficulties with Zoom throughout, or if you wanna invite a friend last minute, direct them to Talc's Facebook page and you'll see us there. We will be sharing a bunch of images along the way, um, and you do have an option on your Zoom screen to toggle a gray slash black bar back and forth to either make the speaker bigger or the photos bigger. So feel free to do that as you please. And uh, okay, I think that's it. Let's get started. I'm gonna begin with a short overview video of the Galapagos, and then we'll be followed by an introduction from David Lewin. A lot of people have an idea, but they don't know exactly what to expect here in Galapagos. It's a unique place where animals have no fear of humans. Everything is just right there for us to see. The guests have a unique experience when they get to do something that perhaps they wouldn't have been able to do in their lives or anywhere else in the world. Coming in here with Tauk is perfect. We have a great group of experts. Right there, flightless form runs. Yeah, look at that, wow. The biggest population of the marine iguanas. I'm a blue for the movie here. Absolutely, it's blown my mind above and beyond anything I ever could have imagined. Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, Dustin, thank you for the uh, introduction and the, um, uh, the video that we just saw. I never get tired of seeing that. Um, my name's David Louie. I'm a Talc product manager. I have had the very good fortune to be with Talc for um, a little over 30 years now. And I've worked in various capacities, uh, which included leading our guests on uh, journeys all over the world. Um, and for the last 20 years or so, I've had the... Um, very good fortune to uh, work on planning our programs uh, on seven different continents. So um, really, I very, very much lucked into the dream job. Um, many places on, on our planet have touched me, um, but I think there's perhaps no place that has touched me more than uh, the Galapagos. Um, what I, I find interesting about it is the accessibility of the wildlife, which has always been important to me in particular. I'm a birder 
and uh, there's an abundance uh, uh, in Ecuador um, uh, and in the Galapagos uh, of birds to be seen. And I think one of the things that I've enjoyed uh, about the Galapagos is our uh, really incredible partnership with a company called Metropolitan Touring. Um, they have uh, the finest guides available, uh, and we use two uh, of, their, of the ships in their fleet. Uh, both the Isabella II and the Santa Cruz II um, to fulfill uh, three different itineraries that we operate in the Galapagos. Some of our programs include uh, Peru and the Galapagos, but I think the future today is, um, uh, is the, the volcanic islands uh, of the Galapagos. We've got different ways, I encourage you to look at our website to see the different itineraries. Um, it's very much a bucket list destination uh, and, and really, um, the best thing you could do for yourself is to, to, to begin planning a trip to the Galapagos. In case you need any help making that decision, we have someone here who is absolutely the, the best ambassador uh, for the Galapagos Islands and for uh, Ecuador. And uh, his name is Klaus Fielsch. He's a, a product manager that I work closely with um, in Ecuador and he's responsible for the metropolitan touring programs that Tauk selects uh, for, uh, for the Galapagos. So without further ado, I'd like to, to hand the microphone off to, to Klaus. Good afternoon, Klaus. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, thank you, Dustin. And um, it, it is indeed a dream job. Um, I, I too was a guide. For the longest time, my name is Klaus Fielsch, and, and, and to many it may not seem like a very Ecuadorian name. Um, my parents were half Ecuadorian, half German, uh, but I was born and raised here. And uh, uh, over 30 years ago, I, I too started as a guide, uh, first in the Ecuadorian Amazon, and then I became a national guide. I was a mountain guide for a while, and then in the Galapagos. And all that time, I was also um, studying in the U.S., but I, I kept thinking, uh, I, I, I cannot imagine a better job. I'm being paid to be in the Galapagos Islands, uh, and I get to talk about the wildlife. Uh, what a dream job it is. Um, as I became a father, I ended up working at the office. I still travel to the Galapagos uh, all the time. Um, and so it's still a fantastic job. And, and, I, and I get to share and talk about uh, the Galapagos Islands. That, that is a very special feat. So let me share uh, my screen with you and um, talk about the Galapagos Islands. Um, is it there, Dustin? Give me a thumbs up. Yes. Oh, perfect. Perfect. So with the Galapagos Islands, um, the, um, the thing about the Galapagos is that the only way to get there is, is through Ecuador. And uh, Ecuador may not be in the radar for many travelers, but you'd be surprised when you get here that it is a small country uh, tucked between Colombia and Peru, and there's lots of things here. It's a beautiful country. A lot of people end up coming back for more of Ecuador. Uh, and this combination of Ecuador and, and, and Peru and Galapagos is a perfect yin and yang situation. Uh, the cultural aspect, the nature of it. You're in one of the world's most biodiverse places on earth, both Peru and Ecuador are among the top five countries when it comes to birds. I'm also a birder. Um, and, and, and you have to look at the size of this country. Ecuador, for instance, has more birds than the entire Amazon, uh, which is six million square kilometers, whereas Ecuador is only a, a quarter of a million. So it's just lots of wildlife, but the food is fantastic. The weather is good. Uh, people are friendly. So it's definitely one of those pl places where you can bet anything that you will be remembering all your life. And, and, and chances are you might, might be coming back. Um, now, uh, Ecuador, the, uh, the trips uh, the, or, or getting into the Galapagos Islands, all, everything has to start from here. The flights, there's only two airlines that go to Galapagos. Uh, and there's only a couple of cargo ships that do the trip from uh, mainland Ecuador to the Galapagos to bring supplies. You should know that th these are islands that are in the middle of the Pacific, far from everything. Uh, although it's right on the equator, none of the cruise ships can stop here and it's not a hub for airlines. So it's like a cul-de-sac and the origin of it is Ecuador. All the flights originate in Quito, stop briefly in Guayaquil, and these are flights that must be pre-approved, disinfected, disinfected, 
and prepared for the voyage to the Galapagos Islands. In fact, during the flight to the Galapagos Islands, it, it, they spray permethrin, and nobody should be uh, uh, upset about this. This is a natural uh, uh, um, in, insecticide, and that's on the overhead compartments, just to make sure that there's no fly or ant coming to the islands. The cargo ships that start in Guayaquil and bring the non-perishable supplies to Galapagos, um, they have to go through the same thing. In fact, there's a dock in Guayaquil, which is only an exclusively used for the cargo ships that go to Galapagos so that there is no accident and something could sneak up on the on the ship and be brought to the islands. As soon as these ships get to Galapagos, scuba divers come and check the hull of the vessel to make sure that there's no a, a species attached to it. So it's extremely strict. Um, and then you get to Galapagos. And, and uh, one of my favorite things to see is when people are looking out the window for the first time, they see the islands because they're huge. They're enormous islands. Uh, and uh, they're also very barren. They're of volcanic nature, and every year there's some sort of volcanic activity. And you also should know when something happens volcanically, we will also make sure that we get to see it. So as soon as there's an eruption, our captain and our operation teams, they're looking at the charts and see how can we get close. Or even if it's three in the morning and there's a wake up list, guests get to see the volcanic flow. It's similar to what's happening right now in Palma up in, uh, in, in, in Spain, it's a shield, these are shield volcanoes. And the type of eruptions we have here called Hawaiian eruptions. So it's the lowest in the scale and it's not a dangerous feat for us to, um, to share with our guests. So coming to the Galapagos Islands is like getting back millions of years in, in, in time to a place where in fact, time, time seemed to have frozen completely. Um, it's a group of 19 islands uh, spread about right on the equator. Um, each island is different from the other in terms of its landscape, to some extent its volcanic uh, appearance. Um, and, 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 and they go from the youngest being a couple of hundred thousand years old to the oldest, to a little bit under five million years. What you're seeing is almost exclusively a national park. There are a couple of little patches here and there, especially on three islands, where there's people living and where there's some farming. But 97% of the surface you're looking at is a national park. So what we want to do is show you the best of this national park and try to show you the best of the wildlife that's available there. There's tons of species in Galapagos. Most of them are found here and nowhere else in the world. But some species are more special than the others. Just like you have the big five in Africa, there's something called the big 15, because you couldn't narrow it to less than uh, 15 uh, with uh, Galapagos. And we want to show you as many of the big 15 as possible. So the itinerary you're looking at, this is one of them. This is the one of Isabella um, uh, Dos that we do with you. As you can see, it starts right in the center of Galapagos and it moves to the easternmost tip of Galapagos. Incidentally, that's where you see the three species of boobies. Then it drops down to the southernmost islands and then it gets to Fernandina, the youngest island of Galapagos, to return back to the center. So this is less than a week. This is seven days, six nights, a little bit less than a week. And you're basically covering five million years of volcanic um, a movement over the hot spot of Galapagos. And you're looking at a number of species. You're cornering here in less than a week, 14 big 15s. I should say most of the vessels in Galapagos will give you in one week, a little bit longer than this, will give you uh, nine or 10 big 15s. We, we managed to put together 14 in less than a week. So that's very special. What else is special about the itineraries is, uh, for instance, on this one, you see all four species of mockingbirds. Charles Darwin came in 1835 to the Galapagos Islands, and this was one of those places in his epic voyage on the Beagle where he saw things that had a very, very strong impact on his ideas. Later on, he published on the origins of the species. Uh, and the species that most caught his attention while he was here for five weeks were the mockingbirds because there's actually four species of mockingbirds, even though from one island you can see the other one, there's a completely different species. And, and this is something that caught his attention. You also get 100% of the pinnipeds of Galapagos in just less than a week. That's the sea lions and the fur seals of Galapagos, all three species of boobies. And you got something special when you get to the West and that's somewhere that you can't see anywhere else in the planet. And that's a penguin the Galapagos penguin and the flightless cormorant. And these are the, this is the only place where you have 
two of the marine fowl that are flightless together, right? There's other penguins in the Southern Hemisphere and other places, and they're all adorable, but none is right here on the equator. Plus, if you think about it, you might be swimming in, in Floriana or in Isabela and Fernandina with penguins, and you're swimming with your regular swimming trunks, not on a dry suit in extremely cold waters down in the Antarctic with penguins. Another thing is you're following uh, three of the four places where Darwin went on shore in the Galapagos. So it also brings you a lot of history. So in every respect, this is a fantastic itinerary. These were crafted by guides not by the captain, the captain of course approves every safety feature of it, but that you pack as much if this is the once in your lifetime trip to the islands, you get to see the most of it. And here's what Galapagos is all about. It's the wildlife. And as Ramiro mentioned on the video, uh, the amazing thing is that you're right there in front of the wildlife. They're not performing for you. They're doing whatever they would do normally. And you're just walking right into a day of a sea lion, a day of a booby, a day of orcas. Um, and you're right there at very close range. We must keep six feet dis uh, distance from the wildlife. And that's been in pre-pandemic times and now too. The nesting right on the trail, as you can see in the upper right uh, picture. Uh, so you've seen, and the wildlife may look up at you with curiosity, and then it gets boring. They just mind their own business. Uh, in the case of sea lions, they come up and sometimes uh, play with us when we're in the water, and then they move on. None of these animals shows any interest in us or any fear in us. So when you're there, you're basically walking through the wildlife. One of the things I heard from somebody and I liked it is when I was a guide and somebody said, um, being in Galapagos is like being brought into a nature documentary right there because you're looking at the wildlife and you have the guides giving you the explanation of the things. It is a fantastic experience. It's also very good for children. My kids have been in Galapagos when they turn six, and that's the age we recommend. Uh, uh, that is, 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 is pretty much uh, fail-proof starting six. Less than six, it's a little bit complicated. There's not much shade on the islands. There's no restrooms. There's no garbage cans. And, and you can't pick up things. You can't run around, climb trees, throw rocks. So, so for some kids younger than six, it could be a bit of an issue. Otherwise, from six, it's perfect. And we have activities for children on board. There's no kids club. Our vessels are much too small for this, but kids love it. And, and we go like their assistant of the guides and uh, the captain, uh, we may teach them knots or a, a tour of the bridge. So multi-generational trips, this is perfect. And then, of course, our itineraries may be fantastic, but our, our itineraries are enhanced by the things that you cannot book. For instance, these wildlife sightings. I mentioned the volcanic eruptions. We make every effort to show these things when they happen, and they happen uh, more than once uh, per year. But for instance, whales, Galapagos is, although it's right on the equator, you shouldn't have rich waters, um, right on the equator, we have 23 species of cetaceans. And uh, that includes the blue whale, orcas, false orcas, pilot whales, false pilot whales, minkes, say, fin, uh, bridey, uh, and these the humpbacks, uh, they are here year round. The humpback is perhaps the only one that has a very distinct uh, seasonality. Humpbacks come when it's summer in the US or in Canada, then they would uh, be in, in, in Galapagos. These come from the Southern um, uh, Pacific up north to calf and, um, and, and to, 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 to uh, feed the young before they return to Southern waters. That's quite a show. The other thing you should uh, know is that these are uh, not large vessels. These aren't enormous cruise ships. Uh, the largest vessel authorized in the Galapagos is 100 guests, and there's only three in that range, and then two slightly less. So five ships are between 90 and 100, and then the rest of the vessels, uh, 53 vessels are single guided. So there's nothing but small vessels in Galapagos, and no external ship can come here and tour the islands. That's not uh, permitted, but these are comfortable vessels. What you see here is a combination of Santa Cruz and Isabela Ross. Um, spacious vessels. Well, when you're looking at vessels, often guests look at the passenger space ratio, which is the tonnage divided by the number of guests, and it gives you an idea on how much space is available. And these are uh, big, big vessels. Uh, Isabella holds only 40, but they both have a passenger ratio of uh, 30, so spacious vessels. Um, the, aside of your cabin, how much space do you have? Excellent. Uh, and then the food. 
Of course, we uh, focus on Ecuadorian food. I'm, 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 I'm very proud about the food that is here. It doesn't have the reputation of Peru yet, but we probably will get there one day. And it's excellent food. It also has international things and regional things and a lot of Galapagos items. So be prepared for fresh fish, uh, almost caught off the, the catch of the day and also amazing things from Ecuador. And we can also um, uh, adjust to special interests. Make sure you let know your agent, um, the uh, uh, food restrictions that you may have so we can also equip the ship accordingly. As far as cabins, they're comfortable, uh, they're spacious, uh, they're quiet. Um, we, they're all our cabins are always one deck above the sea level, the main deck. We always have one deck above because our experience is that on sea level deck, when you put the head on the pillow, you would notice that there is an engine somewhere down below or generators. And that brings a little bit of preparation of possible sound. So having one buffer deck is our norm. So uh, you can sleep better, right? Um, the uh, ships do not have swimming pool. We believe, um, I, uh, I would insist, that out there beyond the vest is the best swimming pool in the world where you can swim with penguins and sea lions and sea turtles and so on. Um, so there's jacuzzi. And now uh, for about seven months in the year, when it's the summer in the north, in Galapagos, it's the Garua season, which is slightly colder. The humble current comes in. So jacuzzis are extremely uh, popular because the um, uh, it's, it's hot water. You can come from snorkeling, walk up. The, uh, your way to the jacuzzi. Santa Cruz has two, Isabela has one. Uh, have a hot shower and then just refresh there while you're still enjoying the Galapagos view. And this is Galapagos. It's a volcanic landscape, but you will not see any, see any paved trails uh, except on the inhabited islands. And we use the paved roads to get to higher elevations to see the giant tortoises in the wild. But otherwise, you're walking on rather barren islands uh, and of volcanic nature. So, for instance, this is North Seymour that used to be uh, lava that flow on the water. And, it, and, and as it cools up immediately, it produces what's called pillow lava. And, and as it has been eroded by millions of years of ocean, and then the island was uplifted, it leaves behind something that resembles uh, a riverbed without the river. So the terrain is a bit more complicated in some places than in others. The trails are not exceedingly long. Most of them average one mile in length. Uh, you require good walking uh, shoes for this. We do have walking sticks if you don't have your own. Uh, a lot of guests find that helpful. Uh, and then you spend a couple hours in the morning, a couple hours in the afternoon on these type of terrains. There is no natural shade. And as you can see, the trees tend to be leafless. Uh, there's no restroom on the islands. There's no uh, waste uh, uh, baskets anywhere. So basically you're bringing uh, your water, your binoculars, your camera, uh, and, uh, and, and, and a good hat. And you see tons and tons of wildlife. When we're done with the walks uh, in the morning, uh, we come back on board and you have a chance to, to change clothes and then uh, to head out again, this time for, we call them aquatic activities. But what it is, is basically in some places, the park allows us to bring down the, the kayaks. We have paddle boards uh, in some places, uh, the glass bottom boat. Uh, in some cases, it's uh, snorkeling. So depending on the site, there's certain activities that are allowed there. This is uh, kayaking in uh, Santa Fe. Uh, and you can see the young sea lions, the teenage sea lions. And you wouldn't know who's more fascinated to see whom. The young sea lions coming up to the to the uh, uh, kayak, sometimes they start pulling on the strings or nibbling on the, on the pedals. You're interacting with wildlife. These aren't trained or tamed by anyone. That is the most amazing feeling. So there's obviously a, a safety talk we have on board about the safety for our guests and for the wildlife of Galapagos. But as you can see, these are very simple kayaks. They're called sit on top kayaks. And that's basically what we do. So there's not much of a training you need to do to qualify for kayaking. And uh, the other option I mentioned is paddle boarding. And of course, snorkeling. Now, for uh, seven months in the year, when the Humboldt system comes in, the water is a bit nippier. So it, it, it is on the high 60s. Uh, we do have uh, wetsuits on board. We also have the snorkeling vest. We have the, of course, everything else, the fins, the mask, the tubes, mesh bags, towels for uh, these activities as well. Um, if you don't bring your own gear, you should also know, this is something we started a, a long time ago, uh, the mouthpiece will be a brand new one. 
even if you're using the, the, the equipment from the vessel. So you're putting a brand new piece, you can unpack it and put it on the tomb and, and it's only gonna be used by you and you can take it home um, if you wanna feel sure uh, uh, um, safe. So snorkeling is something that we highly encourage everyone to do. Uh, we have snorkeling we do right out of the zodiacs. Uh, we also have snorkeling that we do um, uh, right out of the beach. Of course, snorkeling from the zodiac you get to see more. Jack Grove, a good friend and former guide and the author of the Fish of Galapagos mega book, he calls Galapagos the fishiest spot on earth. And when you get into these waters, you you can see why. We don't have coral reefs and sponges and these colorful bottoms that you see in, uh, in the Red Sea or in the Great Barrier Reef of Australia. It's, it's volcanic reef, but tons of reef fish and, of course, sea lions and, and rays, sharks, and you shouldn't be worried about sharks. Uh, the, the species of sharks we see when we're snorkeling are none of the species that we should be worried that could have any sort of um, wrong interaction with our guests. So. That's with snorkeling when you get back into the zodiac is we have these ladders and then you pass the mask and the fins and then you can easily go up if you prefer the, the zodiac type of snorkeling. For the non-snorkelers, um, our vessels are equipped with the glass bottom boats and basically these are converted Boston whalers so they're heavy extremely broad and heavy uh, crafts. And the reason I'm saying this is because when they get into the water, they displace the water. So they, you don't look at a lot of bubbles. You're basically looking into the water and you have a naturalist with you. There's a railing you can hang on to. There's a canopy on top to protect you from the sun and to produce shade so you can see what's underneath. A lot of travelers that are very keen on snorkeling also sign up on the uh, snorkeling uh, activity, on the on the glass bottom boat, sorry, because they um, they like to have a guide pointing out what is uh, it is that I'm swimming when I'm snorkeling. Uh, why is a surgeon fish called a surgeon fish, right? Uh, these sort of things, and and that makes a great great difference. Then um, what you should know is um, Galapagos is open. Um, and Galapagos has been open now for over a year. Um, and I should say Ecuador is one of the first countries to open up um, last year. Ecuador opened up in July, so that Galapagos uh, for uh, visiting. Uh, and it took a little while for the first visitors to really come here. At the beginning, we had a lot of Ecuadorians traveling uh, within Ecuador and going to the Galapagos Islands. Um, but the nice thing is that when in mid-March the pandemic hit worldwide and there was a lockdown in the planet, uh, more than 2,000 Galapago residents were, uh, were stranded in mainland Ecuador and they couldn't fly back to Galapago. So they were for weeks stranded in mainland Ecuador. So when everybody was rehearsing airlines, airports, ground transportation, even the hotels, they were uh, rehearsing how should we handle things in a safe manner. We were also able to test this with real people when the Galapagos residents had to be flown back to uh, mainland Galapagos. And 2,500 Galapagos residents were flown back before tourism was open. And six somehow sneaked past the control and showed COVID um, um, uh, symptoms in, in Galapagos. That's it. Um, and that those six also helped us identify where there could be any leakage in the system to make it even tighter. So Galapagos officially opened July 2020. And in August 2020, we had our first trip on our, one of our vessels. And um, we said we were going to operate even if one person signed up. Um, and um, the nice thing is that the airline said, okay, if you move your vessel for one person, we're going to move our plane for that person too. And in fact, on the first trip, we had a family of six. Uh, and ever since then, from, from first week of August until uh, December 31st, 15,000 visitors went to the Galapagos Islands and came back absolutely in, 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 in ecstasy for, for being back in a natural area, being back in such a, a, a special place. Um, at the moment, still, there is the mandatory use of um, uh, masks um, is in Galapagos. Galapagos is a national park, and uh, by federal laws in Ecuador, all the national parks, there is a, a mandatory use of masks. Uh, there is a mandatory use of masks in open areas. In fact, 
when I drive my car to pick up my kids from school, I wear a mask. Uh, I could otherwise be fined. Um, it may, may be an exaggeration uh, that Ecuador is so tight about it, but uh, the numbers, I was checking it today in the morning, we had uh, a little bit over half a million people picked up the, the virus and Ecuador has uh, 17 million inhabitants. So 3% of our population picked up the virus. Uh, and in Galapagos from uh, over 30,000 inhabitants, the number of cases was a little bit over 1,400. Uh, so a very small percentage and 20 deaths in Galapagos uh, of, um, of, of more than 30,000 um, 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 inhabitants on the islands. Um, I should also say Galapagos is the first province that was completely vaccinated in Ecuador. Uh, in March, we had reached the first quota of uh, vaccination in Galapagos, and then they went down to uh, 16 and older. At the moment, practically the entire population, which isn't very large, again, 30,000, is vaccinated. They're now going for the smaller children, the parents who want to vaccinate smaller children. Uh, but 100% of the crew members in Galapagos is also vaccinated. We reached that quota just uh, 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 two months ago because some crew members picked up the virus in mainland Ecuador, uh, so they could have to wait to be vaccinated. So that's another feature. In mainland Ecuador, we are at 63% of our population is vaccinated. So the numbers of cases has dropped down. Uh, but the number of cases that are relevant, that may be using hospital, hospital uh, intensive care units, that has dropped down to nothing. So the possibility that Ecuador may go back to something very critical is practically null. Uh, and, and, and so you, you know that if you're planning a trip to Galapagos, you're coming at a time that everything is running smoothly, and it has been running smoothly for a long time. Um, We've been doing trips to the Galapagos Islands and throughout Ecuador, uh, and everything has been fantastic. So um, I don't know. I, 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 I don't know how I'm doing with time. I don't have a watch. Uh, I can see there's questions. Yeah, questions. You're, you're, you're great, Klaus. Yeah, we'll, we'll open up the questions now. I know people have been sending them in throughout, so I'll, I'll, uh, I'll start asking those now. And if you do have more, please feel free to, to write them in. We'll, we'll do, some more, uh, do some more chat with Klaus. Um, a lot of people wondering, Klaus, about the seasonal differences in the Galapagos. You know, when's the best time to come, if there is one. Um, but if you could just explain, you know, what it's like in the winter months compared to the spring, summer months, um, that would be that would be great. <clears throat> Excellent. So we were on the equator. Ecuador is one of the 13 countries that is crossed by the equator. And it, it, it has a lot of bonuses to it. Uh, one of them is that the sun rises every day at the same time and it sets at the same time. So there's no difference between a long, longer days or shorter days. There's no seasonality from that point of view. Um, the days are exactly the same. It's very boring to live here. Uh, you never know when the winter comes in. Um, there's a couple of climate changes, especially in Galapagos. There are some distinctive climate changes um, for, I keep saying, seven months a year because the ocean is stronger in the southern hemisphere, we get the cold and Antarctic waters that have swept Chile and Peru and have created the driest desert on earth, Atacama. And then it reaches Galapagos and it bathes Galapagos completely. These are cold waters, but extraordinarily rich in nutrients, which is why we have penguins and flightless cormorants and 23 species of cetaceans. In fact, most of Galapagos relevant species, and you look at the list of the big 15, most of them are somehow marine uh, dependent. Uh, that cold water, uh, of, of course, affects the, 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 the climate, the, the air temperature, uh, the uh, possibility or not of breeze and so on. So you can count on uh, water that is on the 60s. Um, we use wetsuits when we go snorkeling. Uh, if you're coming from uh, the state of Washington, you would find this very toasty water. Uh, but if you're from Florida, this is going to be cold for you. Um, and um, that means that there's also a little bit more breeze. So a windbreaker is a good idea. Those are seven months that coincide with the warmer months of the Northern Hemisphere. When in the Northern Hemisphere, you have a winter. So when it's cold in the US or in Canada, then in Galapagos, we don't have the Antarctic water, but we have warm Central American water that is bathing the, the islands. This warm water... 
uh, it's not warm, uncomfortably warm that you don't even feel like getting into the water. Uh, this is, uh, uh, but it produces rain clouds and it produces rain. Now, everyone should be uh, uh, remembering this coming during those warmer months, which is especially January, February, and March, these are the, the three warmer months, uh, is that you shouldn't avoid those months thinking that uh, I'm going to see nothing but rains. Like, I don't know if you would plan a trip uh, to some parts of Asia during the monsoon season. I don't know. That's not the case. In fact, Dustin, the, um, the, uh, those rainier months we have more hours of blue sky during the rainy season as during the dry season. So the possibility to see blue skies is even higher during the rainy season. So it's one good rain, and then you have, you know, long time, just clear skies until again, clouds come together and then it rains. But you don't have wind. Um, so the, uh, the, the, the water is calmer during those months. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, uh, and in some of the islands, you might even experience mosquitoes. So to make it a rule and easy to remember, there is no bad season in the Galapagos Islands, first thing, because we don't have shorter days and colder days, because we don't have um, a migration needs in Galapagos, the species breed when they feel the conditions are nice, and this could be any month of the year, so uh, there's no time of the year when you would get there and you would find that all the penguins have flown away and that the tortoises are hibernating and that the whales are all uh, hiding on the rocks uh, and that you wouldn't see wildlife. If you look at TripAdvisor or in any other of the social medias for travel, you would see that there's not a single suggestion that you should avoid one month or a season of the year. Wildlife is present year round um, uh, in, in Galapagos. As far as weather, it's never too cold or too hot to avoid a season. And during the warmer months that I mentioned, January, February, and March, what we do is the expedition leader starts the activities a little bit earlier in the morning so that when it gets really warm during the midday, you're either snorkeling uh, or you're on board uh, drinking a cold beer so it wouldn't affect you negatively. Right. That's that's great, Klaus. And I want to get into wildlife in a bit, but um, can you just go into more detail? I know you mentioned at the beginning when you started talking about the, the preservation kind of, of the islands. I know you mentioned there, you know, you had to put, do insecticide in the airplane to, to get over. So if you could just give a, a, another brief kind of overview about how, the, the importance of preserving um, the islands, uh, that would be great. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I should say that Galapagos is one of the oldest national parks in South America. Uh, national parks started in the U.S. with uh, Teddy Roosevelt uh, uh, as a concept. Um, and uh, at that time, a lot of scientists were worried about the Galapagos Islands well-being because people would come here to collect giant tortoises, uh, see what they taste like because they had a reputation of that, that was a fast food island. You know, you stop in Galapagos, collect giant tortoises and continue your trip. So you would have fresh meat for a very long time. Um, and the, the fearlessness of the animals, uh, the word booby is like bobo, like it, it's stupid birds because they don't move away and so on. So the Galapagos was already a big concern for the scientific community to the point that the California Academy of Science came to Galapagos in 1906 to collect as many species before they become extinct. Then, of course, you had World War I, World War II. And at the end of World War II, when the U.S. military base in Galapagos left, the scientific community was now really worried that the Galapagos, if they weren't protected, it would go down, it would, they would completely disappear, it would become extinct like the dodos and so on. So, but they had a, an interesting suggestion. They said Galapagos could work if you have tourism coming here with interest in nature, and some people thought that was the craziest idea. How can you bring tourists into a protected area? It's a contradiction. So they made a study in the late 60s uh, to see whether this was feasible or not. And that study proved that yes, tourism is possible. You have to do it on, on, on ships, small groups led by, an, by a park warden on designated areas and that way you could go on shore and not cause damage. But this would be able to finance the cost of uh, a national park of this magnitude. And it, it, it happened. In 1969, in fact, we brought the first ship to the Galapagos Islands. It was called Lina A. And from that moment on, tourism started in Galapagos. And you could see that since then, investigation and conservation have been continued because this is the yin and this is the yang 
uh, of, of, of a national park. The model of Galapagos is so successful that it is being suggested to replicate it in, in other places like Antarctica. Uh, where uh, on the restriction of how many groups could be at any given moment, the activities you can do, uh, getting um, uh, cleaned up before you leave the island so you don't take seeds or spores from one island to the other. The extreme care we have with everything that is coming into the Galapagos Islands, even immigration laws, you can't, as an Ecuadorian, just move to Galapagos and live there and work there uh, because that would boost the population. So you have to hire locally. So in every respect, all the columns of sustainable tourism have been in effect since 1959 in Galapagos, long before sustainable tourism was even a concept uh, coined by the World Tourism Organization. So it has worked. And we could now see in last year when Galapagos was closed down completely, it so was investigation, so was con uh, conservation. Uh, so tourism and conservation come together. Um, an important aspect, in addition to all of this, is that Galapagos is very far from mass tourism. In, 19, in, in 2018, we had the largest number of visitors in one year coming to the Galapagos Islands, 276 thousand visitors. Now, that looks like a big number. Um, 210,000 of those 276 stayed in the 3% that's not national park, in the 3% on parts of Isabela, parts of Santa Cruz, and parts of San Cristobal, where there's farms, where there's towns, where there's hotels, restaurants, schools, churches, where there's people living, those 30,000 people living, especially in those three islands. The, the rest of this, uh, about 70,000 uh, people, went into the national park that year. That was the record year. So think about it. You can probably fit more people in a football stadium for a Super Bowl than you can have in a whole year going into the national park. And the national park is 2 million acres of surface. So it's a huge national park. We have more people going in one day to Venice, to the, the old part of Venice, than in a whole year in Galapagos, in 183 visiting sites split among 69 vessels, 365 days a year. So I'm, I'm putting a lot of numbers here, but if you do the math, it's very far from mass tourism. In fact, our trips with Tauk on Christmas, that's the peak season. It's sometimes really hard to find a, a, a cabin or a bed in, 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 in Galapagos. Yet you would be out there, and the picture you take, you're looking at right here in the background, that could be Christmas uh, Day, <laughs> peak season when, when everything is booked, and yet you would see as many people as in March or as in February, because the number of groups that are allowed on any visiting site are restricted, not more than six groups. Or Santa Cruz is always alone. Isabela dos, occasionally we share with a small boat here and there, and that way our expedition leader is doing it in such a way that you never get to have uh, the landing site crowded with other people. It's you, you guide, and the groups are small, where the park allows 16 guests per guide. In our case, it's about 11 or 12 guests per guide, the average, so smaller groups, one guide, one language, one experience, and you don't see anybody. That's great. That's great. Especially for a sentiment today, right? Yeah. Um, now, you mentioned the inhabitants of the Galapagos Islands. Just real briefly, Klaus, if you can just go, I think it's interesting. Um, I don't think a lot of people realize that you know, people actually live there. Can you just go into just briefly, you know, how do they live? You know, um, on the, you mentioned they mostly live on those three islands, but, you know, how do, how do the inhabitants live? Well, yes, they live in these uh, three islands, especially Floriana is the fourth island. There's a population of uh, 150 people. So when one person leaves, everybody knows it, right? Uh, on the others, uh, it's mostly they work with something related to either tourism or uh, conservation or investigation. So that's that's about it. There is a small fishing fleet. Uh, there's And it's getting smaller and smaller. What they're allowed to do is catch certain things and certain means in certain times of the year. And it's bought by the, the vessel. So it's something that, again, there is it's of a sustainable fashion. Um, and most of our crew, most of our staff, is from Galapagos. With very few exceptions, they're all Galapagos residents. Now it's a law, but in the past it was it was our choice to to hire uh, uh, local people, and uh, these are people where that have the most amazing backyard, right? And 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 you can imagine the guides and the the sailors 
you know, uh, these are the animals that live in their neighborhood and they get to show it to guests. So it, it also adds to the experience of um, Galapagos. Uh, they were very, very badly uh, hit by the, by the lack of tourism last year when everything was halted. Uh, so the fact that Galapagos is the first region in Latin America that was open, again, that is something that they really appreciate. Um, and again, conservation and investigation is hand in hand back on the islands again. Great, thank you, Klaus. Um, I wanna get into the seas and the animals a bit. There's a lot of questions about just cruising in general. Are, are, the, are the seas choppy at all? Are there different times when they are? Or is it, um, you know, based on weather? It's like, like every other sea. <clears throat> Well, for most of the year, the ocean is extremely calm. You may have uh, days of, 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 of wind, of local winds, August, September, but it's never too bad that uh, a ship could need uh, stabilizers. In fact, in the last two years, um, brand new vessels uh, came into Galapagos Islands, built for the Galapagos Islands, and none of them has stabilizers because... Uh, they're very expensive uh, additions to any vessel. And it makes perfect sense if you're sailing around Cape Horn or down to the Antarctic and you meet those uh, enormous white beards of, of, of the oceans. That's not Galapagos. Galapagos, in fact, is what the British sailors call the doldrums. And that's on the equator. That's that part of the equator, it's also called the intertropical convergence zone, where you don't have winds. In fact, I look out my window, I don't see any trees shaking because there's no wind. Unless the wind is produced locally, you don't have the systems of high and low pressure moving about in this belt throughout the world. So that's the part that sailors feared because back in the day, the ships were powered by wind. So the doldrums were feared by sailors. So you get baptized when you cross the equator, <laughs> right? That's not the case. Now our ships move with engines. So it, 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 in Galapagos, you have calm waters uh, and, and, and throughout the year. And when we have areas where we could expose a little bit the vessel, that's at night time. And, and we even do our night stretches in such a way, the captains are very careful that we don't drop the anchor in the middle of the night and wake up uh, some of the guests in the front of the vessel. Uh, none of that happens. Um, August, September, when there are breezier years, like last year we had La Nina, you could feel a little bit more of rolling on the vessel, but never these seas that require you to put ropes or any, any of that. The Santa Cruz too, that we use with, uh, with talk on, on the Christmas uh, trips, that's, uh, that ship was built for uh, the um, uh, uh, Tierra del Fuego region. It sailed the Beagle Channel and the Magellan Strait and around Cape Horn. And it did that every month, a couple of times. Sailing around Cape Horn is some of the most uh, moved, uh, choppiest waters in the world, most feared or uh, respected waters in the world. So imagine that vessel that was built for those waters in the Galapagos, in the doldrums. So it's as smooth as butter. You don't even notice that the ship is sailing. So that shouldn't be a fear. Now, that being said, my advice is bring your favorite ginger candy. <laughs> this is ginger, uh, pickled ginger, or if this is ginger uh, gum uh, or whatever it is. Or if you hate the taste of ginger, bring ginger tablets. Ginger is the best thing that stabilizes if you feel a little bit Queasy, is that the word, Dustin? And queasy, queasy. Queasy, yeah. queasy, queasy, not queasy. <laughs> queasy is a toy. Uh, so uh, ginger works fantastic. And, uh, but but uh, ginger as form of tablets is no, not always available here. So if you bring it, it helps. Uh, uh, the, there's something called Sailor's Secret. Uh, and I know that the America Cup, uh, even those old salts that are doing these competitions, they have those tablets somewhere in the sleeve in case things look bad. But Galapagos, it would be more a psychosomatic thing rather than a real situation of rough seas. Well, good tip. And along those lines, Klaus, um, how physically fit does one have to be to fully experience a Galapagos on and off the ships um, and as they go off on excursion? You don't have to be an Ironman, um, but you have to be able to walk comfortably on uneven terrain. Um, for instance, here you can see on the lof, lower left, uh, the, the type of terrain in Galapagos is a volcanic nature, so it's a bit more bumpy. Um, and uh, good walking shoes are a must. 
Uh, we do have walking sticks on, on board if you don't have your own. That helps you to a bit more stable. Uh, the trails aren't very long. Um, they're about one mile in length. Um, and uh, some places are as easy as the beach you're looking at here. So you can go with sandals or tevas. But most of the trails, because of the volcanic nature, will require better footwear. So tennis shoes uh, or hiking boots would be um, appropriate. Um, unfortunately, Galapagos is not available for anybody with the mobility limitation like uh, wheelchairs. And having said that, I should also say that we had our, our vice president for four years is he's, 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 he's in a wheelchair. And he was even nominated for a Nobel Prize at one point because of all, everything he's done to make Ecuador uh, available for our, uh, our Ecuadorians in, in wheelchair. Yet Galapagos didn't make it. In fact, a couple of years later, he became president for another four years, and he was not able. Galapagos, because of its nature, it's 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 virtually impossible to do it with wheelchairs. In fact, there is a company that uh, specializes in uh, travel for mobility restrictions. And in Galapagos, all they can do is they go to San Cristobal, stay in a hotel, they do some trips on the island, and then they go back. So none of the ships has elevators or ramps because none of the trails in Galapagos are. Um, uh, available for wheelchairs. In fact, when we leave the island, like let's assume at the lower right corner, they're leaving the island as, as opposed to coming in. You need to rinse your feet, your shoes, the soles, your equipment, everything, so that the sand stays here. And there's an, another rinsing we do when you get on board of the ship to make sure that you're not bringing spores or seeds from one island to the other. So that's a very good question. Wow, yeah, good. That's always one that... Um that the guests have uh, have questioned about just, just in general to make sure that they can fully experience wherever they're going and on that note just to quick aside there's a lot of questions coming through uh, you mentioned earlier on the restroom situation if you do need to use the restroom while you're out on the islands knowing you said that you there wasn't any how is that typically handled <laughs> you don't have to spend too much time Klaus. just just a quick a quick question. yeah now you should also know that uh, uh for we we get kids starting six age six when we recommend and uh the oldest traveler i i i, I was with uh, was a gentleman who was on his third honeymoon and he was turning 100 the day after galapagos um so the the age range is very broad uh, and it doesn't specialize or get stuck in one area but we don't spend so much time. Think, remember that when we're going on the trails, the trails are about one mile. So we leave after breakfast. We do that one mile hike. Of course, we stop a lot and see the wildlife. And then we get back on board. We change clothes and then we go out again for snorkeling. So that normally means that you don't have a whole morning without a restroom. So for most of our travelers, I would say 99% of our travelers, it's not an issue. Um, the um, Galapagos, as I also pointed out in some earlier slides, has uh, practically no vegetation. <laughs> so if you're thinking that you could also go behind a bush, most of them tend, tend to be leafless. So there wouldn't <laughs> be much of use. Plus, it's something that we discourage completely unless it's an emergency that cannot be handled. Of course, then uh, we'll find a way to handle it. Uh, you can't be on your own when you're on the trails. Uh, that's another thing. It's like, oh, you guys go ahead. I'll stay back here. Nobody is allowed to be left under the without the supervision of the the guides. The guides have many hats, and one of them is also park wardens for the for the park. Uh, so if somebody is doing something wrong, when nobody's uh, paying attention, then the guide could lose the license. Um, that being said, somebody was staying always behind, not on our vessel. Uh, was actually starting a little collection of lizards. And tried to sneak it out of Galapagos. So that guy has been in hot water for, for not paying attention. Uh, all right, let's get into the wildlife a little bit for the last couple of minutes here, Klaus. Um, just in general, I mean, you mentioned that we typically see 14 of the 15 big 15. Am I right there? Now, what happened That's on to the, the other two trip? Yes. What happened to the other one? Where's um, the 15th? The 15th, you see, that, that's, that's interesting about Galapagos. Some animals, you see them in virtually all the places. Like the blue-footed boobies, you may see them every day, um, some days more than others, but you don't see them every day on their colony, like here on North Seymour Island. Um, the, uh, the one you don't see on the itinerary that I pointed out is the uh, Santa Fe land iguana, and that iguana is only found on Santa Fe Island. 
We see the albatross on that trip. The albatross is only seen on Española. So that, uh, that itinerary has, uh, these are island exclusive species, we call them. The red-footed booby is only found on two spots in Galapagos, in Genovesa and Punta Pit. This trip goes to Punta Pit, so it has one of the two sites. So from our three itineraries, only two can show you the red-footed boobies, unless you're really lucky. In fact, this island, uh, North Seymour, on this image, has a very small colony. We believe maybe four or six uh, couples nest here. So if you're very lucky, you might see one here. On this trip, of course, you already see them on Punta Pit. Penguins, you know, penguins. There's very few penguins in Galapagos. And they're all, also in very few spots. So they're seen on Floriana, on Isabela, and Fernandina, and on, uh, on, on Bartolomé, for instance. So uh, only a few islands have them. Then the sea lions are virtually in every place. Marine iguanas, it's interesting that itinerary pointed out, although you see them every day, you see two different species, subspecies on San Cristobal, including one that's called Godzilla. Uh, then you see the most colorful ones. They're Christmas iguanas, they come because of red and green and black. They're down in Espanol and Fernandina. And then when you get to uh, Fernandina, um, Espanol and Floriana, when you get to Fernandina, you see the largest uh, iguana. So you see different subspecies of iguanas in one trip. Same species, different subspecies. That's what uh, caught Darwin's attention. How is it that within a, one archipelago, you can have such variety of, of, of species from one island to the other, and you can virtually see one when you see, ah, that's is Española over there, we'll be there tomorrow, different species of lava lizards, mockingbirds, and so on. Wow, that's amazing. Do you have a particular favorite, Klaus, that you enjoy seeing when you're down, when you're down there? My favorite bird is the frigate, uh, but that's only because it, 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 it does the most amazing features. We can talk about hours and hours, and I, I know our guides do, why the frigate is so fantastic. It's the best flying bird on the earth. It's, it's absolutely brilliant. Uh, but you need to go there and hear about it. There's two species in Galapagos, the Magnificent and the Great. We put them as one big 15 because the guides will tell, uh, to tell you how to tell them apart. That's my favorite animal in Galapagos. <laughs> And I do want to ask you one last one before I play a quick video to end. Why is a surgeon fish called a surgeon fish? <laughs> okay, that's a good question. Here's the thing. The, the surgeon fish, sort of a flat fish with a long snout, and then the, the tail in the back. And towards the tail, you can normally spot three white dots. Now, when you come closer, or if you see a dead fish, you can get closer. You can see that these three dots are not just dots on the external uh, dermis of the, of the fish, but these are actually extensions of the spine that go through the skin. They go through the skin and they're out there. So you basically have extension of bones on the skin and they're extraordinarily sharp. They're like scalpels. And the idea is that if something wants to catch a fish regularly as the fish tries to escape, the last part you get is the tail. That's why some lizards and geckos get rid of the tail so you end up with a tail and I can grow a new one while I still run. So this fish has these very sharp things. So if something tries to get it by wiggling, they will cause serious injuries in your mouth, possibly forcing you to open it and they can escape uh, uh, and have a second chance to survive. Hence the name, the three scalpels on each end. So six scalpels sticking out. <laughs> Thank you, Klaus, appreciate it. Um... Thank you so much, Klaus. This was this was amazing. A wealth of information and knowledge, of, of course. Um, I am going to end with a three-minute video for those who, who would like to stay on. Klaus, can you just go to the last slide quickly? Yes, absolutely. Okay. So I just, did just want to mention a couple links. If you're interested to see our, our itineraries on, in the Galapagos, you can visit tout.com slash Galapagos. And then those other links at the bottom are to our blog page, um, to our brochure page, if you'd like to, if you'd like to order a brochure, um, and to our entry requirements page and um, what is open and available to you right now. All right, so I am going to play this last video. For those who'd like to stay, please do. Uh, if not, feel free to leave. I know we're at time. So again, thank you, Klaus. Uh, we really appreciate it. And um, we look forward to seeing everyone in the Galapagos.